but nobody knows that. If somebody <laughs> like got on some, did some crazy search, just happened to search your name and stuff, you would be live. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have Betsy Magruder here. <laughs> a small little group. I, can't, I don't know how to. Hey guys. There's about 15 people here. It's not that too big. But um, they, uh, uh, they can see you up on a big seat. I can do this. Your, oh, your face is really big. It's like one of those fathom events thing at the movie theater. So oh, it's like Matt or Betsy Magruder. And um, so uh, we're just going to talk. I'm going to ask you some questions. This is, as I told you, this is sponsored by this club we have called FEM. And uh, once I'm done asking you a few questions, I'm going to turn it over to Mandy, who's the president of FEM, who's going to ask you some more questions. Awesome. And then we'll just have people come down, and hopefully they won't be shy. They all get really shy at this. I don't know why. They're really loud during class. But um, so now let me think. What do I need to ask you? I feel like I've asked you so many questions, and I'm going to just – we, you know, many of them have seen the little film I put together. Uh, but what you want to know is that we spoke for probably an hour, right? I mean, we were yeah. we were together chatting for about an hour, so I cut a lot out. Yeah, uh, I had to really trim down, and all of it was good. All of it was interesting. There was like I could have just put it as is, um, but I figured I didn't want to, you know, make an epic. So, um, so why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about how you got started and what drew you to your particular um, position. I've got to really, I've got to check my framing here. It's not very, not very attractive. Much better. Yeah. Well, all right. Um, how I got started in the film business, you mean? In the film business as an AD. As Just, an AD. Well, I got started in the film business. I actually have an undergraduate degree in film, and um, the university I attended had uh, professionals come and teach classes so that was great because we got like an insight into what the actual um, people who were film professionals went through so that got me started and then I started um, volunteering my services as a PA and uh, then you know got hired as a PA and worked my way up from then I was on a TV movie as a PA you know calling for quiet in the basement and was watching the first AD who was so enmeshed and everything with the DP and the director. And I remember turning to the line producer who was a friend of mine and saying, how, what is, how do I get to do that? <laughs> and um, then I just, you know, I just put my sights to that and worked my way up as a PA and then as a second AD and then as a first AD. Okay. And um, tell me, if you don't mind, tell me a little bit about where you're from and did you have a, background as a child as a youth were you interested in films or were you did performances or was there anything where you drawn I mean, did you discover film in college or what was your particular path to it before that no I didn't when I was a kid I thought I would be a famous novelist so that didn't turn out so well um, I was a philosophy major and I was actually uh, transferring uh, colleges and I was not able to transfer a lot of credits, my philosophy credits. So I had taken a summer school class in film and that, and I just went, well, that was interesting. Why don't I just change majors? I can do that in two years. And it was as ridiculous as that sounds and unplanned as that sounds. That's, that's how I got into it. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to turn you up here a bit. Okay. And um, so then tell me about... Uh, uh, you kind of did this big abbreviated version of I became a PA, then a second, and then a first. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that ladder. Well, I, I, I know your ladder is a little different than it is now, so so maybe talk a little bit about how it is now too in comparison to yours. Yeah, it was a little, a lot easier, not even a little easier when I came up because I started my first job as a first was in 1983, so I was working my way up in the late 70s, early 80s. And there was a lot of non-union production in Los Angeles. And I actually got a toehold in through a film from, I mean, a friend from school who was working at Roger Corman's place. And so I got a job through her at Roger Corman's place doing all those B-movies back then, like Battle Beyond the Stars, and I can't even remember the names of half of them, um, which 
then just got me tons of experience right away as a PA. Um, and then it was, it was actually not difficult for me to become a second because there were no union rules, it was all non-union, and a first just sort of took a shine to me and said, you want to be my second AD? And I was just kind of like, yeah, okay, I, what do I do? <laughs> and at that time, there were no second seconds. I think we had, I mean, I was sitting on a lockup, which if you guys don't know what that is, it's where you just sit and guard a door and call for quiet. While I was writing the call sheet, there were no cell phones, so every call I had to make to an actor as a second, I'd have to go find a phone to do. Our walkie-talkies were like the size of small televisions. I mean, it was, you know, the dark ages. Um, and I was only a second for a couple of shows because the first decided that he wanted to hire his girlfriend. So to make me feel less um, annoyed about the whole thing, he got me a job as a first. So it, I had a very unconventional career path now. If you want to come up, you either go through, and you want to be a union first AD, you can go through the DGA training program, which is a program specifically designed to take people to train them to become assistant directors, which is a, itself a bit of a hard road to hoe um, because you're making very little money, but you're making contacts. Um, or you come up as a PA and you get your days and you submit and then you have to do third area work. And to be honest with you, I don't even know all the ins and outs of it. It's so far beyond what I had to go through, but I know it's, you need a lot more days than I ever needed to join. And um, they've made it much more difficult. There's a lot more members now, so they've made it a little more exclusive. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I've got, I'll ask one more question. All right. One more question. Um, this is, this is completely not chronological. I feel like I should ask, be asking you chronological questions. We're going to jump miles into the future, <laughs> not into the future, into the present. So you just sent me the day out of days for Hail Caesar, which was awesome. Oh, right. Did it make sense to you? Yeah, totally. I mean, I know a day out of days. But what I don't know, I know you have, there's some, there's some letters that I wasn't aware of that I never use. Right? Okay. So I'm sure a D stands for drop and a P stands for pickup. Because right. I know you said, you talked about that in my interview. You referred to this, a drop and a pickup, you referred to it. And yet that's a term, even though I've AD'd, that I'm not particularly familiar with. Can you explain to us a bit about what you mean when you're scheduling and you do a drop and a pickup? Absolutely. It's a really useful scheduling tool because um, the SAG contract allows for a performer to have 10 consecutive days off and it breaks the pay period. So you can have them work for one or as many days as you want initially. However, the initial pay period is paid as a day player on a day rate. Then you can, if you have 10 days off, you can drop that person off salary. So they're not held, which is the other term. When, they're, when you don't have 10 days and they continue to be paid, they're held. When they're dropped, they're, not, they're off salary. And then you pick them up again uh, but this time, the contractual obligation is as a weekly player for the second contract period. So it just allows you to, um, uh, it's just a way to save money. You know, if you, if you know you can break the, the, the players up like that and it works in the schedule for other reasons, um, you can drop and pick them up and save money. There's all kinds of caveats to that. They're, they might be a contract player anyway, depending on what their level of pay is and what their involvement with the production is. But as a rule of thumb, it's just a way to get a, get a player off salary if they're not needed. Okay, so they start at daily. They have 10 days, but not more than 10 days? They can have more. They have to have at least 10, but the 10 includes oh, weekends. So it can be Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's just 10 consecutive days. It's consecutive days, and then they're in until weekly. Yeah, and then you pick them up again. And, and, it, and like I say, at the beginning right. and the end, it can be any amount of days. You, they can work for 30 days or one day at the beginning, and one day or 30 days at the end, but initially you pay them as a day player and the second t contract period they're paid as a weekly. I've never done that. I've, do I've done a lot of scheduling and a lot of, uh, you know, as a line producer, I've done a lot. And, um, but there's always been on the SAG uh, indie contracts, you know, where there isn't consecutive employment, so it's not even a big deal. So you don't have to worry about it. Oh, you don't there's have to no consecutive employment on the sale deal? No, once you go down below to, uh, I think, I, you know, there's three tiers of indie. Now I'm, we want to hear from you. We don't want to hear from me. But there's three tiers of indie. One is like nothing to 200, 250. One's 250 to like 650. And one's from 650 to 2.5 million. And, uh, and I think the two lower ones, 
there's no consecutive employment issue. So, and, and I've never done that. I've never done higher than that. So I've only done the only, thing. the only, uh, in, you know, indie one I did under that agreement was the third tier because there was definitely consecutive employment. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm going to, so I, I love, I, you know, I, I could be really unselfish. I mean, really selfish and say, I keep talking to you about all this stuff, but it, this is, they're here for this opportunity to talk to you too. So I'm going to turn you over to Mandy. Okay. Oh my gosh, you're so much taller than me. Okay. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this is really exciting for all of us, I'm sure. So, um, okay, since this is a club for promoting uh, female filmmaking, I wanted to talk to you about or ask some questions about your experiences as being a woman on film sets because it's such a male dominated industry just maybe some of the experiences that you've had with that or some struggles that you've had maybe sure is there a specific question or you want me no, just to no i guess just yeah if you have an experience to share or well i think i was so naive when i started out i didn't have a chip on my shoulder at all about being a female ad it didn't occur to me that it was a problem and I think that was a help for me because uh, I didn't perceive it as an issue. However, I will say when I first, probably the first 10 years I AD'd, one of the first questions any male director would ask me is, well, do you think it's a problem that you're a woman first AD? Like, does the crew respect you and respond to you? Which I always found hideously insulting. Um, because I didn't, I didn't feel like I ever had that problem with the crew. Um, you know, when you're in the crew, you're all in it together, and I think there's a camaraderie there that is not, doesn't lend itself to that kind of an issue. But I think people above the line always wondered if that was a problem. Um, I did, there is a big difference, I think, because I've worked on a couple movies with women uh, directors, and it is a bit of a different vibe, I have to say. Um, I hate to say that because it sounds so black and white, um, but I did notice a little bit of a difference. Um, and uh, I'm kind of struggling here. I don't know specifically what to tell you. I don't really know what to specifically ask you. So <laughs> um, I guess, so, cause you've been doing this for so long. I mean, you, you said you've just been first dating for over 20 years. Have you noticed any kind of shift in either um, how many women are on set or how generally they're treated on set or even towards you. Like, obviously, yeah, you said you got those questions from above the line. Do you still get those questions or? No, it really has changed. Um, I think a lot of, a lot, there were a lot of women second ADs for a long time and a lot of those women have moved up. Um, some of them my contemporaries, some of them sort of the next class, you know, beneath me. And I think that has made a huge difference. I think that um, along with the kind of regimentation of the AD department, it used to be that it wasn't quite so cut and dried. Now there's a first, a second, a second, second, possibly a trainee, additional seconds. And I think with that kind of regimentation, a lot of the seconds and second seconds were women. And so I think not only did crew members get more accustomed to working with women in those positions and to be given information and to be interacting with them in, in that kind of leadership role, but then they started moving up the ladder. So definitely there were more women that came up and that made a, a difference, I think. Also in other crafts, like camera, like, I mean, not just the departments that are traditionally women's departments, like costume, hair, makeup. There are women electricians, there are women camera assistants, there are women, um, I think across the board, I'm trying to think of any department that aren't, there aren't women in. I suppose I don't really see women grips. I don't really see women uh, special effects people. But I think with just the kind of, I wouldn't say the business has opened up because that's a little broad. It's still, you know, women are really a niche on the set. There's, with the exception of those departments I mentioned, like hair, makeup, and wardrobe, you really are a minority. But over the years, it has changed. I mean, it, in my view, it's changed pretty dramatically. There's a long way to go. 
Um, and I do not get those questions anymore from producers. I mean, not only do people realize it's just uncool and like sexist to ask that, I mean, there's just a more elevated consciousness in that regard, but because there are more people in my position that are women, I think it's just not in the forefront of people's minds when they're interviewing. Yeah, that's, that's good to hear. Um, so have you, I mean, your primary focus has always been first assistant director. Have you ever considered doing anything else or is there anything else that interests you that you're like, maybe someday I could do this? <laughs> I originally went into once I once I decided I was gonna try and make a career in film I thought I would be an editor that was my first love now back in the day um, everything was done on film so I got an assistant editing job but all I did was reconstitute roles which probably means nothing to you guys but it means sitting there reading little edge numbers taking a block splicer and putting everything together in a very dark room for 14 hours a day so I changed horses instantly after that um, I never really wanted to direct. I do not want to be behind a desk, so production management isn't really that interesting to me. And since I don't really have a financial mind, for producing, line producing, that's not so interesting to me either. So I'm actually pretty happy doing what I'm doing. I like the mix of, you know, First AD has a lot of dimensionality to it because you've got the whole prep period where it's very analytical and you are sort of at a desk and you're scouting and you're planning and you're figuring everything out and that's one kind of side of you and then <clears throat> you know when you're on set it's it's a much different job you know because you're running the crew and your time management and call sheets and you know how much time do we have for this scene and when is this actor due and what elements are needed for this and that's a whole nother thing so it's it's an interesting job I think for someone with a busy mind like me it keeps you keeps you moving Okay, I, that's all the questions I have, so I will open it up to the rest of my fellow students here. And why don't you guys come on down and just kind of, if you want to ask a question, come on down so they're kind of waiting as we, as we walk. And be sure to tell Betsy your name. Okay, hi Betsy, I'm Elizabeth. Um, oh, hi Elizabeth, I'm actually an Elizabeth too. I know, I got told today by somebody that I needed to change my name because I'll get lost in the sauce. They're like, your name is too plain. You need to change your middle name to like Twinkie so that people know who you are. <laughs> it was oh a joke. My gosh. Elizabeth. But that's okay. Um, I was going to ask you, because I have a very busy mind and sometimes I end up getting distracted or lost in my thoughts. And so when you're reading different presentations like, of what different crews expect of which job descriptions and they always say you need to be well organized and you need to be all of these things for a first AD is there what do you do to keep your mind fresh so that every time you start a project you feel like you're fresh for that project instead of being maybe burned out from the previous project you know each project is so different in terms of the material the scripts are so different that even though you have a common uh, vat of experience you know to rely on it, it makes itself fresh just by virtue of, of the material, even though a lot of the movies I do are with the same core group of people that I've worked with for like the last uh, 15 years. Um, you don't, that only helps keep it fresh because you're not distracted by like trying to learn someone's name or figuring out who they are. All you're doing is exploring the creative and the filmmaking process with them. So that actually makes it fresher if that makes any kind of sense to you so i think my answer to your question is just you find it in the script the scripts are all different and so when you get involved with the script it becomes a new exciting adventure all right because with Dwayne, he gives us an assignment where we have to schedule a segment of a movie and i was so excited to do that because that's what i do every day and trying to figure out school schedules and things but by the end when i had to submit it i was like just take my assignment Dwayne." <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was getting lost in, in, in organizing the day out of days. And, in, and so I just didn't know. I was like, maybe I'm not cut out for that. Because the idea of a first lady sounds so magical that I thought maybe my brain would give out. But I guess you answered my <laughs> question with that it's different because the script is different, you know. And the well, requirements, just, I think. Your brain's not going to give out. I think part of the, the, the <laughs> thing that happens when you're scheduling a movie for real is there are stakes. You yeah. know, there's a reality to it. And you know you're going to go out and have to do this day yeah so maybe the difference is an academic versus reality <laughs> thing where so you know if it's academic it's like ah, this, i'm not really attached to this because i don't really have to follow through on it 
Okay, you got that, Dwayne? I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, well, that was my question, but I might think of one later, so I'll, I'll let okay. you Thank you. Sure. All right. Let's see if I frame up. Hi. Hi. My name's Travis Bourne, and my question deals with your relationship with directors, um, especially when you're in the prep stage, uh, looking for locations, getting crew, and then when you're on set and you're running the crew, they're working with the actors, um, what advice would you give for us that want to be directors and how do you strengthen that relationship with the first AD? What do you want from a director? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, that's an interesting take on it. What I want from a director is honesty. I was gonna say clarity and then I went, wait a minute, they're not always clear. So what you really want yeah. is honesty because you wanna know what they know as well as what they don't know, because then you have the information or lack of to work on. You know, this last picture I did, Hail Caesar, is a good example, because there was one sequence that the directors were very unclear about. And because I knew they were unclear about it, because they stressed that they were unclear about it, A, we scheduled it way late in the schedule to give everyone the most time possible to prepare for it, and B, I didn't, pepper them with questions about it because I knew they had no answers. So I would say if the director can communicate whatever lack of knowledge or knowledge, that's what the first AD needs the most and to not be afraid to not know something. Perfect. Now also I've worked with some first ADs that could be described as tyrants and they're always just yelling and belittling and then I've worked with some first ADs that you almost don't know they're there. They're just, they're not, you know, where are they? Where are we in the day? Um, how do you find that balance from, you know, having an enjoyable time on set, but still getting people to, you know, do their job and be in a timely manner? Or are you a tyrant? I don't know. Maybe that's a, <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> how dare no, you so, ask me that question? <laughs> so, so where's um, the balance for you? Well, I don't like to yell. I don't like that vibe. I don't think it's productive. So I just on an intellectual level, I don't go that route just because I don't find it practical. I don't think it works. Um, and I think that people do that out of frustration and fear and lack of information. So I try, because I'm a huge prepper and I'm all about analyzing it and figuring everything out as far as I can. I'm all about, I just see my job as expediting. I want to give everybody the information they need it's clear that I run the set. I mean, I'm a presence on the set. I'm usually right by the camera or 10 steps behind, depending on what's happening. And everybody knows I'm there. You know, I think that if you are the fount of information, you don't need to be broad because that's what you're there for. So people will naturally come to you. Like on, on our sets, on the Coen Brothers sets, it's very quiet. Nobody, it's, it's very quiet. I mean, conversations are held at a very quiet level. And most of my information goes out over the radio. So I'm the, and to the, the opposite, I think. But the way I put it in my head is just that, you know, it's, it's about information and analysis and, and leadership as opposed to just kind of stress release. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you. There's more people. So thank you for your time. We really do appreciate hey, it. Thanks for the question. Hi, Betsy. Hi. My name is Eric, and uh, I was just curious, um, obviously looking over the, your filmography, you've had an opportunity to work on a lot of the Coen Brothers projects, and um, I guess I'm just curious about on the, the films that you work on that have so many A-list actors and the scheduling um, and everything that goes into that, if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about the... Um, I guess the headaches and some of the, the conflicts and things that can happen when having to work with so many A-list actors in their schedules. You know, you guys have really interesting questions. I'm impressed. Dwayne, you've got good students. Um, I mean, generally what happens, I hit a is a good example, um, when you have a lot of A-list actors is, is scheduling is a nightmare because they're not very available, especially when the parts are uh, of a shorter duration. Not that they're not, you know, big in the picture, but they, they're not a long contract period. Um, and it's a nightmare. I mean, usually what happens is that you get, I get handed a list of available dates for certain actors that can change 20 times, you know, by the time we get around to it. Now, I will say, 
for the most part, when they work with Joel and Ethan, they're a little more buttoned up about it because they know that they're not going to be um, taken advantage of because the boys have a reputation for um, being straightforward with everyone. But it really is mostly about scheduling. I mean, in terms of working with them all on the set, they're to, I can't think of one that's not professional, prepared, and you know, on time and ready to work. So it's really just a matter of working out their busy schedules, and that just, that's just a you know, a tile puzzle. It's like, oh, Scarlet can work this day, but we can't have the set till this day, and you know, it's just figuring that out. Yeah, cool. And then you kind of touched on a little bit, um, you know, Joel and Ethan's reputation. Um, I mean, obviously, if you know great directors reach out to you and they ask you to be on their films, it's probably an easy decision to say yes. But what would you say it is about them that um, makes it so easy, or I guess the decision to continue to work with them, and what's what it is about them that you love so much? Oh gosh, that's such a multi-layered question. Um, I think mostly the thing is that we, the three of us, have a very similar work ethic. We both, we all three, like to prepare. They prepare like crazy. They. <clears throat> generally storyboard everything, which then if I have a storyboard for everything, it's so easy to go through it with a DP and, and do my work, you know, figure out how many hours it needs to shoot this scene or that scene. So it makes my job infinitely easier. And plus they're just, they're very open to the process. Some directors don't like to be involved in the process. They don't really want to know from, uh, you know, my questions, you know, <clears throat> about the details of filmmaking. Um, but they're, uh, you know, they started doing it all themselves. So they, they know, they've got this all figured out. They know more about everything than all of us combined. So they're very open to all those questions because they understand what it means in terms of the preparation. Um, and as far as just other like actors wanting to work with them, I mean, they just give creative people so much uh, input freedom and yet structure and support. So I think that people like that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi, I'm Janelle Hi. Phillips. Um, I've related so much to what you've been saying. Um, I'm a pretty new film student and my first love was editing also. Um, and then Dwayne told my class just a week or two ago about um, more about your position. We watched your interview and it really struck a chord with me. I thought, oh, I could do that. That sounds really fun. I have an analytical mind. I'm, I'm a planner. I like getting stuff done. Um, and then I started reading more about it and it seems like it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of things like that. So I just want to know, do you feel like you're still a part of the creative process? Ooh, well, probably not in the way you think. I mean, you know, I take the script and my job is to actualize it. I don't have input in terms of the true creative thing. Now, the one thing that my job is, does that's creative is I direct the background action. So, you know, any time there's extras in a scene, that's me and my staff directing them. So that's a very creative aspect to it. I happen to think that scheduling, problem solving is creative as well. So I get a lot of creative satisfaction out of it because it's, it's creative problem solving. So I, you know, if you want to be a writer or a director, that's a creative process on a whole different level. And no, as a first AD, you don't get that. I get my creative kind of uh, happiness out of directing the background and scheduling. Okay, thank you. Um, I had another question too. I, I feel like, uh, since this is the Femme Club, I feel like I have to uh, reel in my bossiness so much because uh, I don't want to be seen as bossy. You said earlier that you are a tyrant. I feel like that might be me more, would be a tyrant if I was an AD. Um, so I'm just, I was just wondering if you ever felt that way, that you you didn't want to assert yourself too much because you didn't want to be the bossy woman. I know exactly what you're saying. Um, I, I have felt that. I don't think I've ever acted on that. Um, I think inherent in the job of first AD is you do have to be sort of a bossy personality. I mean, you have to follow through on your convictions. If that's bossiness, you have to be willing to um, just say, yeah, we're doing this. You know, it's like, we're doing this. You kind of have to take the bull by the horns and run with it. Now that is something that you don't walk onto your first set 
being able to do because it's a process of learning how to be assertive without being a jerk and turning everyone off because you need to work with the crew. You can't see yourself as their dictator. It's a, it's a cooperative. One of the great things about filmmaking, one of the things I love about it is that it's cooperative and other department heads solve problems for you all the time. So you don't want to shut them out of the process by turning them off by being too overbearing. At the same time, I think you do need to be bossy. You do need to be assertive. You do need to have a personality or you know, you, you won't be seen as a leader, which you need to be. Thank you so much. I'm gonna, I could talk to you all day, but I'm gonna let other people ask you questions. Okay, thanks. Hey, how's it going? Hey, there's a lot of dudes in the femme club. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the long hair, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, my name's Benji. Um, I just had a question for you. Um, uh, no Country for Old Men is like one of my all-time favorite films. Um, and so I just, I know on that, they spent a lot of time getting shots done over just like the golden hour over multiple days. And I was wondering if, if that was a big frustration from like planning and if that set you back at all, or I guess ultimately I'm kind of wondering what was your hardest film to to first AD and kind of the frustrations that came with it and how you solved them, I guess. That was, that's a great example. That was really hard because we had uh, what we called dusk panic and dawn scramble. Because, you know, the window of opportunity for those shots was very, very limited. And if you're a student of the film, you'll remember the sequence where the pit bulls swimming behind him in the water, they get on the sandbar, bang, bang, bang. Yeah. That was mostly done in one dusk and one dawn. There were a couple second unit shots that were done later. And we had multiple cameras, uh, not necessarily camera, not necessarily a camera set up, but there was a crane set up in one place, a tripod set up in another place, mm -hmm. this set up there. And we had diagrams that the DP and I would work out together of what would be done in what order. Everybody knew it, it was like marching orders. You know, we would go, we would try and get like six shots per, you know, window, but it was an astonishing amount of planning that went through that. And we probably, the river was its own thing, but then we probably had four or five other dust panic dawn scramble situations throughout the thing and it was it was really really hard that was a very coordinated crazy effort that was one of the hardest things we've done for sure it's totally worth it though yeah <laughs> <laughs> um do you have any do you have like another film that that was super hard like just all of it was hard to put together and and keep going just oh brother where art that was really hard um we were on location in Mississippi um, and we were traveling all over the place. And most of the time we were driving an hour from where we were based and then we'd change where we were based and drive an hour from there. We were all over the place. And <clears throat> it was also really ambitious. We were doing uh, two to three company moves a day and a company move is when you pick up and change locations. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it was, that was, real tough and we got some weather and it was Mississippi and a million degrees and a million degrees humidity. That was very, very difficult just logistically that one. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, cool. Thank you. Sure. Follow it up, uh, Betsy. Yeah. What? You good to keep going? Yeah. I'm just going to move you because I need to plug in because I'm down at like 9%. So the background's going to shift a little bit. Yeah. You, you, you're home. All right. And plugged in. I think we have a couple more questions. Does anyone else have any more? Okay, well, we'll see what happens after two. We've got two more people here. Hello, I'm Brianna. Nice to meet you. Thanks for chatting with us. I had a question about just your daily priorities on set. Um, when you come to set, is it different every day, or do you have like a checklist you go through, like working with different department heads? and? You know what's most important. How do you how do you manage that, and what kind of is the number wow, one goal? Question. Um, it does change day to day, and usually I have something that's weighing on my mind. That if I know it doesn't happen early, I'm going to be worried about it. And me being me, I'm like 
working on that from, because I usually get to work at least a half an hour before call, if not an hour before call. And my staff is usually there 45 minutes, an hour, whatever the earliest makeup call is. So yeah, I mean, it could be, you know, did the specific actor arrive on time? Did the 200 extras get into the works on time? Whatever it is that day that, that I'm going to be worried about. It's, but the thing is, it's not necessarily first up. There's always going to be something that's, that's Barbie or, or weird about the day, but it could be after lunch, too. So, you know, there's no, I don't have a specific day to daily thing where I go like, well, I'm going to go check in with a gaff or I'm going to check in with a key grip. That's just kind of specific to the situation. I mean, I always check in with the directors. I always check in with the DP. I always check in with my staff. But other than that, it's very specific to the situation. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Uh, my name is Skyler. Thanks for joining us tonight. This is really cool. So I appreciate your time. Um, my question for you is, uh, I heard you mention earlier when you were talking about your responsibilities on set and your responsibilities in pre-production and how they're almost two entirely separate um, positions almost. Uh, what, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what goes into pre-production as a first AD. Sure. Um, first of all, you'll get the script. Excuse me. And oftentimes you get the script and it's not broken down into scenes or, or locations or anything. So that's the first thing you'll do is just line out the script. Scene one, interior, night, mansion, you know, whatever. And then from there, you'll break it down. You know, I think everybody uses Movie Magic software now. So you'll break down each scene into the composite elements that are needed. Mm -hmm. And from that, you generate um, all kinds of stuff. You generate a cast list. You generate an extras breakdown. Um, but then the next step is, is scheduling. I mean, that's the big thing. And usually what happens with me is they'll, they'll want me to schedule before the picture, way, way in advance, so that they can have some sort of schedule to make a budget off of. Even if it's pie in the sky, at least it'll be something, you know, to go from. So yeah. I'll kind of chunk together a preliminary schedule. And that's the first kind of step. And then from there, you just refine, refine, refine. The schedule gets more refined as the locations are found, as the casting's done, as the specific needs get made, as the budget comes in, the number of days gets more refined. So, and it all just is a very, it's a process. So, you know, it just happens bit by bit. How, how soon up until um, production are, um, is, the, is the schedule locked? I mean, to where you have, um, and obviously things change and everything like that, but to where you have a, a pretty, as you were talking about refined, you know, where does that kind of come together as far as before the production starts? That's really um, different from show to show. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, I ha like to have a really firm schedule for the tech scout. And the tech scout is anywhere from two to three weeks before shooting. So I'm, I'm shooting for something really, really solid mm -hmm. before the tech scout. But what always happens on the tech scout, and the tech scout is where all the department heads go and see all the things, is that right. things that come up in the tech scout that change the schedule. So, yeah. But they're generally minor compared to bigger issues. So I would say three weeks out, I want to have something real solid. By a week and a half out after the tech scout, I want to have something that's done. Now that being said, <clears throat> you always issue, you always, when in the middle of production something happens and you always have to put out new schedules. So, mm -hmm. you know, stuff happens. Right. I have one more question, um, if that's all right. Um, I, I'm just curious um, if, if you could tell me a little bit about on a major motion picture how um, getting the first shot off of the whole production, you know, kind of that that feeling or like process, you know, I kind of have a, a picture of it in my mind, but I, I mean, that first day, you know, and kind of how that uh, tends to go. Well, I have a specific scheduling strategy for the first day. I never want to, you never want to do the opening of the picture, um, a, dr a super dramatic scene of the picture or the ending of the picture, in my opinion, on the first day, because Usually, the crew doesn't really know each other that well. The actors aren't that comfortable. So I try and pick something that is kind of humdrum, you know, that's not a dramatic crux moment of the picture. Yeah. And, and I usually schedule the first day really light, just so that, um, I mean, even on these pictures I do with Joel and Ethan, where we all know each other, 
I always schedule a light first day because it's a little rocky getting up and going. People are nervous. You know, so I, I schedule it light and I schedule something that's not super important. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much. Sure. Appreciate it. Okay, we have a couple more again. We had a couple okay. more and then we have a couple more again. Uh, hey, uh, I'm Andrea. Uh, I just, you mentioned earlier that uh, there's a different vibe on set with a women director. Do you think you could elaborate on that? The specific picture I was thinking of, and I, this may be slightly unfair because it was a long time ago, um, it was kind of a women's film because it was called um, A Thousand Acres. And it was a, a woman's story, and it was a woman director and two women leads. So there were a lot of women around because of that. Um, but it was a more supportive atmosphere in that the director kind of cared more about what how people were having, a, what their experience was like. I think most guys that are directors just kind of care about getting the work done. That seems a little sexist and broad, but that's my experience. All right, no, that's cool. Uh, one kind of random question. Do you have a preference um, shooting on location versus shooting at a stage? Do you like I really like to mix it up. I think when you're on location, it's it can get grueling because there's so many things that are outside of your control. Right. Oh, do you mean location like like away from out of town, or do you mean location like a practical location? Uh, like the last one, practical. Okay, so like you're shooting in a real apartment as opposed to building the apartment in a stage. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, I like to do both because, you know, part of the, the AD's job is to control the exterior environment, and it's hard. You get worn down doing that. You know, imagine being on Hollywood Boulevard at night for – six weeks that's tough and then on the stage you know it's all quiet and you don't have all that to worry about but then on the stage you get kind of complacent because the sun doesn't come up the sun doesn't go down there's no kind of artificial beginning and end to your, I mean natural beginning and end to your day so I like to mix it up okay sweet uh, thank you so much sure hello how's it going hi yeah. I'm Emily I might just have two questions. Um, I'm trying to decide which one to ask you first. Uh, make a decision. Okay, got it. Um, do you, you talked a lot about your staff. Um, are you the one who hires those people that work under you? Um, yes, the short answer is yes, but there are sometimes, sorry. Um, there's sometimes okay, that we have, <laughs> sorry, I, I had a cough drop and I had to get rid of it. Um, there's sometimes that um, above the line people or certain interested parties really want you to hire a PA. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not exactly, you're not beaten over the head with it, but it's strongly encouraged. Okay. And uh, so with that caveat, yes, I hire everybody. I usually interview everybody. A lot of times I've worked with people before, but I hire the second, 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 and however many staff PAs we have and the trainee. Right. And is there a particular thing you look for in those people? Um, are you looking for film experience or set experience or do you sometimes go out on a limb for them and like them as a human and decide they can pick it up on set? I mean, what, what are some things you look for? I definitely look for personality because on the PA level, uh, the experience can be so varied. It's a plus if someone has experience in a certain, uh, like dealing with background or working on a, a, tip, a kind of movie that we're doing or something. But really what I look for is people who seem very enthusiastic, but not in a goofy, bubbly way, enthusiastic like in a serious way. And, um, yeah. and who, who it, I, don't, I don't know, I tend to go for film nerds, you know, for people who like, really like film and express that. Cool, and then I had one more question, um, more about like your personal life a little bit. Um, I feel like when I think about working on a set that is like so many hours, like how do you even have a life at home? But I wondered if you had like a hobby, like do you find that you have time to even have a hobby or like hang out with people? I don't know, I like think of that and I think to work in the film industry, I pretty much have to give up these things I care about or people, but has that been the case for you or have you been able to balance life and working? 
you know, I don't think it's a particularly great job for balance, to be honest with you. You're all on and then you're all off. And the way I've dealt with it is to take a little more time off than I think a lot of people in my position do. Um, it's true. When you're working, man, you're, you can work easily 14 hours a day, and that's only a 12-hour shooting day. If you have a 12-hour shooting day, but you're there a little early to make sure things are going right, and you're there a little late to make sure everything's wrapped up, you know, yeah, it doesn't leave a lot of time for, um, for that stuff. And it's not the kind of job where you can just leave the set. I mean, some people do. But it's not the kind of job where you can just leave the set for an hour and go take care of personal business. It's just, it, that is tough. In prep, it's a lot more, it's a lot easier. But the shooting period is, is difficult. It really is. Interesting. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time today. So I sure. think I'm going to turn it over back to Dwayne. Cool. All right, Betsy, I can't say enough. You're so awesome. I'm so happy that you responded to that random email a year ago or so. It wasn't quite a year ago. <laughs> it's been really a pleasure to get to know you and to have these events. I want to tell you, oh, this is, this is my face. I know you like my chest, but this is my face. <laughs> the, um, I want to tell you that a couple nights ago, I dreamt I was on a set directing, and I, my AD was so horrible. <laughs> that I, I attacked her. I, I, when she, she turned her back on me and she just wasn't paying attention. She was watching what someone else was doing while I was talking about it and I pushed her in the back. I said, you listen to me, I'm talking to you. And, uh, one of those onset dreams that I'm sure you've had many of them. Um, but anyway, thank you so much, guys. We want to give her a great big hand and, and uh, I really appreciate you. Thank you, no problem. We really appreciate you uh, uh, taking this time. And hey, no problem. They they were great questions. So, so. Ah, oh, well, there we go. Do they think I'm funny? You know what my anxiety dream is? My anxiety dream is that my walkie-talkie doesn't work. <laughs> and you're talking and no one can hear you. And I'm talking and no one can hear me. I'm like, bring in the gladiators. Bring in the gladiators. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a great way to end it. Now I'm going to have that dream. Thank you so much, Betsy. You're great. Yeah. And, and uh, hopefully we'll get to see you again soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.